if you want to be like the pro do-it-yourselfer, the, the, the pro guy, man. Hey guys, it's Joel Walsman, Jefferson Electric CEO and Master Electrician. Today we're going to be talking about air conditioner disconnect switches and the associated wiring. You can tell this disconnect right here is about as old as dirt. Coach John Wooden said, success is in the details. We're gonna walk you through a lot of details. So it's gonna be a little bit longer, but we wanna leave no stone unturned and want you to have a good comprehension for how to do this yourself. So first thing I'm gonna do is take a picture of the installation. And uh, I just wanna be, I wanna have a record of where all the wires are landed. Um, the existing installation may or may not be correct. Maybe they've gotten white and black wires reversed in their purpose and intention, and I want to document that so I can put it back the way it is or make a total correction, both at the panel and at the disconnect so things get sorted out. Um, so I'm just going to start taking it apart here and walking you through the process. This is a fused pullout, non-fused pullout actually, disconnect switch. You can see that I have just disconnected power, which was passing through the copper bus from the line side, that's the incoming power side of the disconnect, to the load side. On a disconnect, quick clarification, line side and load side, it's alphabetical. Line is the incoming, load is the outgoing. So in this case, load goes to the piece of equipment, which is our air conditioner. So I've got a uh, disconnect, I've just disconnected power to the load side, to the equipment, the air conditioner itself. I'm gonna check power on the line side with my digital multimeter. And then we're gonna turn off power once I'm confident of exactly what's going on here. And getting it put back together in awesome fashion. So now I'm checking the line side. Nope, oh look at that, line and load has been reversed in this disconnect. Code violation number one, I'm sure we'll find more before it's done. 248 volts, that's good. Now we're checking line to ground. 124. So we know we have a good incoming ground connection, which the way they've made that up and just twisting the two grounding conductors around each other, that's a code violation. They should both be independently landed on the ground bus. You also notice in here that we've got white conductors that are being utilized as ungrounded or hot conductors, and that's a code violation. The fact, not that they're being utilized as such, but the fact that they are unmarked. They need to be marked at the point of termination so that there's no confusion. This is a 240 volt appliance, which means that you've got two hot conductors coming in. 120 volts here and an opposite 120 volts there, which makes a total of 240 volts. This is not a neutral conductor. Your air conditioners will not have a neutral conductor, but they will have two incoming line conductors. Make sure you get those labeled correctly. I'm pretty confident about what's taking place here. Let's go shut off the power and then we'll get started. Air conditioner is labeled. It's gonna typically be on a two pole 30 amp breaker, but the breaker and the wire need to be sized to serve your specific air conditioner. The air conditioner will be marked with a label that has both the minimum and maximum manufacturer allowable fuse rating or circuit rating. And, uh, but two pole 30 amp is by far the most common. Now I've got, two other two pole 30 amp breakers in this panel. They're both off at this point, but I'm not going to take for granted that that's it. If you stop respecting it, it'll bite you. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna retest to make sure power is off indeed, and then we're gonna get started tearing it apart. Large flathead screwdriver, Let's pull things apart here. Man, it's all rusted up. Lots of water infiltration and the effects of high humidity conditions over a long period of time. This. Heating and cooling system is actually going to be replaced in the west portion of our house here probably within the next week or two. So I'm doing this work in preparation so that the whole system is new and fresh. And I don't want a weak link in the chain with this thing to work. It just hum along beautifully. Man, I always tear up my hands doing electrical work. Pretty good if I'm not wearing gloves. I really like these gloves. There'll be a link in the description. I have a lot of tactile, uh, you know, control and mobility with these things. It's beautiful. 
Like I said inside, um, air conditioners are labeled with minimum maximum fuse ratings, breaker sizes, but this one is actually so old that it's come off. So what I've done here is I've sized my air conditioner disconnect to a standard size which matches this wire sizing and to the new system ultimately to which it's going to be paired. Um, this is a bathroom exhaust vent coming from inside. It's kind of impinging on my working space here, uh, so be careful around that. But these, uh, this is a perfect example of what I'm going to show you at the end of the install here. This is a pro tip and very, very few people do this, but it, it'll yield dividends. Look at that. The masonry anchor has pulled out both top left and top right. No holding power left. And you know why? Is because water infiltration. There's nothing, there's no sealant on those uh, anchors into the masonry. So water will definitely, most definitely, beyond the shadow of a doubt, infiltrate into those drilled holes around the anchors and the uh, fasteners. And then it's going to freeze and it's going to expand and it's going to cause the anchors to pull loose like they did in this installation. So I'm going to show you a better way. This bottom anchor is still holding, but it's much newer. Somebody added this because the other anchors weren't doing their job anymore. <coughs> All right. Now this is not typically the case that there's a box mounted behind the disconnect. So it's gonna change things up for us just a little bit. I just wanna, I'm clearing out the cobwebs, not really because I care, but I just wanna see what's happening in there. I wanna make sure that I don't have, there is an old wasp nest <laughs> I'm clearing out, but I just wanna make sure I don't have anything to be concerned about. Looks good. Now it's time to line up my new disconnect. Uh, it's provided and equipped with a hub, which I'm going to install on top here in a moment. All right, so what we've got is a lockable throw handle disconnect. This is a little bit beefier um, than the $8, $10 cheapy air conditioner disconnect that you can buy off the shelf at your home centers. This could potentially be an electrical supply house purchase here. And uh, the reason for that is it's going to, um, one, allow you to lock your disconnect in the off position, on position, but it's got much better action and beefier components um, making those electrical connections. So I'm, I'm kind of a fan of this. And I'll show you how the fuses install. It's not required that you have a fuse disconnect, but we had this one lying around at the shop, so I grabbed it. I want to position the disconnect such that the wire can come in on the back side here. I'm not going to be able to utilize the knockouts because I'm out of space with that bathroom exhaust vent. So I'm going to drill a new knockout to allow for wire entry. And I want the disconnect to cover the whole box so that I can seal around the box and prevent water from infiltrating into any of these existing holes. All right, I've selected a half inch Romex connector as a bushing to ease the entry of my cable into the back, back of the box. You do have to have a fitting or connector to uh, prevent the metal edges from cutting into your cable over time. That's a code requirement. So I'm gonna prep my AC disconnect now, right here on the ground. Using a step bit to drill my hole, there's no magic there, but it's just a handy bit I've got in my stuff box. I'm gonna drill out to seven eighths to accommodate my half inch Romex connector. We're gonna talk about that in the next video. Why does seven eighths pair with a half inch connector? What sense is that? I'll, I'll tell you. Real quick, real quick here. Um, I'm actually gonna reposition myself just a little bit. What you wanna do is keep this metal box from 
being grabbed by the drill bit and the high torque of the drill. So I've actually um, turned down the torque setting on my drill substantially from 11 to seven because I don't want as much kick. If that, the edge of that bit grabs in the hole, it can grab and twist. And um, actually we've had lacerations to the hands and other parts of the body from exactly that scenario. This too, I'm drilling on um, moderate pressure and low speed on purpose. I'm gonna reduce the heat in the equation and I'm gonna preserve the life of my bit by drilling on a lower speed as opposed to a super, super high aggressive speed. This is a three speed drill and I'm drilling on one. All right. Kind of want to drill in the face here. Trial fit, there it is. Get rid of those metal shavings. Make sure that connector's a fit. Let's get it in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, a little bit more. A little bit more, fellas. There it is. That step bit is just so handy. One bit, really high durability that will accommodate all kinds of sizes that are common to the electrical industry. There'll be a link in the description for that bit as well. All right, I want the fittings to be tool tight, not just hand tight. I'm gonna give it the last quarter turn with my pliers. Go ahead and this uh, ox guard is going to save all kinds of time and energy. It's good for electrical connections and improving conductivity, but it's also good for ferrous metals and preventing rust, which if I didn't put it on here, this hub, not that I'll ever need it, but I just put it on my outdoor ferrous connections, uh, aluminum wiring, etc. If I didn't put this ox guard on here, I'd never get these screws back out. Within six months or less, they'd be all seized up. And the rust between the screw and the thread would be so bad that I'd literally be shearing the screw off, drilling out the hole, and retapping the threads if I wanted to service this component of the disconnect. But Having done that, I guarantee you I could walk back to, to this in 10 years and be able to extract those screws usably. There's a, a label in here for service disconnect. I'm not gonna be utilizing this as a service disconnect. That refers to the incoming power to a, a building or a house. This is just an equipment disconnect. So I've removed that label from the equation and I think I'm ready to lay it out on the wall and install. I'm not using that cork. It's not a bad idea, but I'm using duct seal on all my penetrations. And you know why they put the, uh, <laughs> they put this line side conductor on the load side of the previous disconnect. 
is because there was insufficient wire length to reach the line side of the disconnect. I'm not getting anything out of the wall here either. Sometimes there'll be slack inside the wall like a, uh, a seven or a service loop, which we've talked about in previous videos, but I got nothing, bro. All right, always challenges in an older home to overcome. This addition to the home is a 1970s edition. Uh, that's 50 years for things to go out of whack. All right, I like how that's gonna sit. Let's grab my level. Beautiful. Now I always put crosshairs, these uh, <clears throat> anchor holes on the bottom, I'm gonna put the crosshairs up and to the inside so I don't risk my Sharpie extending outside of the footprint of the disconnect. That's gonna be enough to guide my, my drilling once the hole gets a little bit messy with that masonry anchor penetrating. And at the top, I'm going to do down. This is top center, so down into the sides. I've got real clear markings. I'm using blue tap cons to secure the box to the wall. And that's this anchor right here, but I'm actually going to use a shorter version. That's, that's overkill for our application. Probably an inch and a half to two inch tap con, a count of three. These are quarter inch tap cons. I'm gonna drill them out with a 3 16 bit. You always, for, for tap cons in this sizes, and maybe larger sizes as well, use a bit that's 1 16th of an inch less than what's the, uh, than the diameter of the bolt itself. drill my hole on purpose a little bit because one if I under drill and that tap con reaches the end of the hole it's going to catch and it's going to split out the brick real real bad and two I want a place for that dust to go so that the uh, debris in itself doesn't inhibit the connection of the tap con to the masonry. You'll notice one phenomenon that's taking place here is that these two holes are real close to the edges of the edges of the brick. This one split out just a little bit. I can definitely deal with that and this one as well, but this one being close to the corner of the brick, um, it's at risk by the time I drive that fastener that it's going to blow out. The older the brick, the more likely you're going to have uh, some brittleness and deterioration and, and blow out from that hole. I'm also going to blow my holes out, closing my eyes when I do it. Could probably use my safety glasses. All right, now here's a, here's a pro tip for you. I love my duck seal. This is gonna show up in video after video. I don't know what I love more, my ox guard or my duck seal, but they're both real, real good. If you wanna be like the pro do-it-yourselfer, the, the, the pro guy, man, get a block of duck seal, get a tube of antioxidation compound, and you're off and running. So what I'm gonna do here is break off a nice, healthy chunk. I'm gonna work it like Play-Doh. It's going to be real hard in cold weather, so if you're doing this during the late fall, winter, go ahead and throw it in the uh, dash of your truck or inside on a, a heater, a vent. So I'm going to take a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to actually circumference. Uh, I'm going to circumference the hole. No water is ever going to get in that hole. By the time the disconnect is mounted up to the wall and that duct seal is compressed, that is a permanently waterproof hole right there. I probably overdid it on quantity. A thinner bead is gonna be just fine, but I get excited about my duck seal. <laughs> I'm gonna do it, repeat that process for each of these. <clears throat> the cleaner the surface, the more likely your duck seal is gonna stick. 
This stuff is so easy to work with. If I was using caulk at this point, like a good outdoor sealant, which I'm not averse to, I really like OSI, also available in the description, but um, it's just gonna get real messy. If I have a trial fit, I'm gonna put that disconnect up against the, uh, up against the house and something's not right, and I've gotta pull it back down, this duct seal, it'll kinda get on your hands a little bit, but it's so forgiving. And I'm also, because I don't have any mortar patch on hand, and I'm not much of a mason anyways, I'm gonna take the tiniest bit of duct seal and put it in these holes as well. I'm just gonna work it in there and seal them up so that nothing gets worse out of control. It's not color matched, but I've got so much going on here anyways, I'd rather be watertight than, than not. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the remainder of this duct seal, I'm gonna make a bead, and I'm gonna circumference at least the sides and top of that box so that it is also water shedding because <clears throat> the water's just gonna get in there and it's gonna sit. And I guarantee you it's gonna get in there and I guarantee you I don't want it. If your bead of duct seal is too thick, then it's gonna fight you when you go to install the box. So just mash it down and, oops. Now actually I'm thinking about this real quick. I've got two ways to do this. This wire is gonna be too short to reach the line side of my disconnect, which is really where I want it to land. I could create a significant safety hazard by reversing line and load sides of the disconnect. Someone who's not paying attention might reach in there thinking they've disconnected power, touch the load side only to find out it's energized. Of course, they should be taking proper precautions and using a non-contact voltage detector or something of that nature, but you never know. So I could make joints in this box, which I think I'll do. I think that's gonna be a little bit cleaner. I'm gonna make up my connections to extend my wire in this box, pass it into my disconnect so that the final product inside here is a little bit more clean. Let's do that. So what I'm gonna do right now is pigtailing the wire. I'm extending my black, white, and ground with equally sized but slightly different type of wire. And this, um, if you've got any concerns about pigtailing, actually see a previous video that we've done on that, pigtails. Um, and uh, let me just walk you through the process here. I'm gonna take my solid wire, I'm gonna straighten it out. You know, before we get too far, it's real important to note that pigtail, duck seal, tiger shark, not to be confused. <laughs> this is 10 gauge stranded as opposed to 10 gauge solid. That's the actual conductor difference itself. But this has an overall common outer jacket. This is Romex. It's not intended for outdoor use. Now, <laughs> professionals in the industry are gonna get into a whole big old fight about this, is where does, where does outdoor start and indoor end? I'm gonna give you my opinion, not that it's completely right. Feel free to contend in the comments below. I'd love to engage with you. You're gonna make me better. I'm learning every day. Uh, I've got the humility to be wrong here, but um, at this point, this box, I think, is still an indoor location as long as it's properly sealed. Now, it wasn't when we got started on this project, but it will be. I also would contend that inside of this junction box is a dry location. At the, hate me, hate me if you want to, but then as soon as we leave the disconnect and we go through our liquid tight, our flexible plus plastic conduit, PVC conduit to our air conditioner, that by definition would be an outdoor raceway, which would be a wet location. Romex would not be rated for that. That's potentially the, the biggest, most commonly uh, found issue with an installation like this is the utilization of Romex in an outdoor wet location setting for which it's not rated and therefore you're gonna get deterioration. That's what's gonna happen. Your electrical wiring is gonna deteriorate until you have failure or some other type of hazard. Using my wire strippers, stripping back this 10 gauge stranded. I'm gonna use the 10 gauge strip hole, but I'm gonna be a little bit ginger because stranded conductors occupy a higher volume than solid conductors. And so if I really pinch that down, what I'll end up doing is I'll score the outside, and that's very undesirable. I'll score the outside of my stranded conductors and I'll cause them to lose overall rated ampacity, which I've got plenty of ampacity here in these conductors, but I still don't want to do that any way, shape, or form. 
Uh, I'm using red wire nuts, which are appropriately sized for two 10 gauge conductors. Wire nut sizing can be found on the, uh, the packaging or in the instructions. The manufacturer will include how many and what size of conductors are permissible under the wire nut of choice. I'm gonna really snug that down. I'm gonna give it a tug test. Man, making tight electrical connections is like one of the most important things you can do. Um, I'm gonna kind of seat them together. I'm gonna be mindful that none of my strands become dislodged carelessly. I want them all in there. I'm gonna give them a little pre-twist to the right. Wire nut goes on righty tighty. I'm gonna, I can feel that bite, the, the, the threads on the inside of that wire nut just, ooh, that's one of the best feelings right there. Just a good snug bit grabbed everything. I'm gonna fold it. These 10 gauge solid conductors will fight you pretty good. I don't need to mash it. Ah, oh, there it is. All right. Uh, these three coming through my... We've got plenty of wire length. I'm gonna cut it about here. Famous last words. All right, now I've got my nut driver in my extension. 5 16 nut driver for quarter inch tap cons. Ah, there it is. Satisfying bite. You can just tell by the way that grabs and pulls into the work. Beautiful, beautiful. And it'll be up there to stay because it's sealed from the weather. We're not gonna be victims to the freeze thaw cycle. All right, you're hearing a lot of really good action from the driver. Um, to me, that's a beautiful sound. It sounds like um, crunching, breaking, but that's a, the impact action of the driver and the threads of the Tapcon really biting into the brick. So <clears throat> that's a healthy sound. Woo, that impacting action, beautiful, beautiful. All right, we got a good grab on all fronts, but I'm just a uh, little out of level, so I'm gonna loosen up, straighten up. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna loosen that one too. That is gonna work. I like it. Time to terminate the wiring. Okay. Uh, so that green screw, that bonds my ground connection to the housing or the cabinet itself. The housing should never be energized, but it should be electrically connected to the safety conductor, the ground, such that if there is ever fault current to the AC disconnect or any other type of electrical metallic equipment, it's able to fault to ground and not to personnel. All right, the um, hot conductors on top are interchangeable. I'm able to put red on left, black on right, or reverse that, it doesn't matter. I am gonna go ahead and I've got a pretty good length on that. I think I'm gonna keep the full length of that conductor. I'm gonna strip it back only as far as is required. I don't want uh, a whole bunch of bare conductors sticking out of the top, but having a little bit is acceptable. Loosen my screw. There it is, check that out. All right, this is a stranded conductor, so I'm gonna do the wiggle and seat, wiggle and seat. And I'm not gonna death grip it at this point because I am going to use a torque screwdriver to make sure that that is a quality connection. I'm gonna keep the full length on that as well. If I make a mistake, gotta rework something, 
I love to have just that little bit of extra. Pre-bend my connect conductors. Here's another thing that's important to note when you're working with copper conductors. They are subject to damage if you over bend them. Now that's kind of hard to do, but there is something uh, called bending radius that's in the code. You can look it up. Maybe I'll include the uh, code reference in the description below so that you know how tightly that radius on the wire, the conductor wire, can be um, made before it causes damage to the conductors. That's something to be mindful of. All right, I'm going to tuck them back in there, kind of give them a little bit of memory, a little bit of bend so they stay back against, against the cabinet and out of the way of the cover. So you'll notice that inside of this cabinet, I've only got a single one grounding terminal. I can't tell looking at the terminal itself whether it's rated for one or two conductors, but it does have a specific rating um, based upon its listing. <clears throat> so since I don't know, I'm going to default to the lowest standard, which is one, and I'm going to install one of my two, uh, one of my two grounding conductors here, uh, right there under that, uh, that terminal, and then I'm going to connect my other grounding conductor to the end of this by means of a wire nut. So I'm actually going to strip back a midsection, which is a little bit hard to do if the wire is all bent, doesn't slide real easily. I could strip the whole thing, but I've got the jacket. It clearly labels what this is. I'm not against that at all. All right, so I strip back a mid midsection here. I'm gonna slip it into that terminal. I'm also gonna to torque this down later once all my wiring connections are made. And I know that I don't have a code violation at this point because I've got one conductor under one terminal and then I'm going to go ahead and prep this other one. I really don't want that much. Just get a little bit, little bit long here. All right, now it's time to install our liquid tight to the air conditioner. I'm going to install three quarter inch liquid tight the whole way. I'm going to replace what's here. Um, what's here has been dinged up pretty good flattened and damaged and it's closing in on end of life. Not quite as bad as the disconnect was. Uh, but let's take the cover off, disconnect the wiring again. Power is most definitely off to the unit because we've disabled the power supply. And again, before disconnecting the wiring, you're gonna wanna take a picture so you know what you're looking at. I think the wiring compartment's in here see. Yep. There's a wiring schematic, a couple of screws holding the inside cover. There we go. All right, here it is up at the top. Real, real simple. We've got two brass colored terminals. Again, this will be interchangeable since we're dealing with a single phase system. And we've got one grounding terminal right there. It is marked GR for ground. I wouldn't use any of these other screws for that purpose. There could be something on the back side of that that's distinct for uh, facilitating a really good ground to the uh, AC unit and that's real real important. So let's take this apart. Could use some nut drivers, but I'm only gonna need a couple of turns with my pliers to get this loose. I wouldn't take it all the way out. Again, there could be a nut or something on the back side of that that it's engaged with. Keep that screw in the housing. Straighten out those wires. Three quarter inch lock nut and out it comes. There we have it. The old whip, AC whip, is disconnected. All right, here I'm going to be using a non-metallic system. The old one was a 
um, metallic liquid tight. Uh, really no tremendous preference one way or the other. Um, they're both going to be code compliant for most jurisdictions for use like this. I am going to, because I've got a big 90 degree connector here, I've got lots of torque to be able to simulate tightening with tooling and I would always tighten lock nuts and fittings with tooling and not just by hand. I've got a good snug fit. It is plastic so I'm not over snugging. And I've intentionally used a 90 degree fitting with a downward turn because I want to have a nice drip loop on that um, non-metallic liquid tight and uh, I want to have a good entry to the unit such that if I used a straight connector I would um, and the liquid tight was coming in like this I'd actually have the potential of putting a little bit more torque and leverage on that uh, connection and there is a uh, concentric knockouts there so I could pull accidentally pull that knockout uh, right out of the unit and it could become loose and disconnected. So this is our liquid tight right here. It is a PVC flexible conduit. It's like a PVC conduit, but it's a, it's a lighter gauge and it's got flexibility to it. Um, it's going to provide quite a bit of resistance to the insertion of my wire. So as opposed to most conduit systems, installing the complete conduit system before pulling wire, I'm actually going to lay this out, measure it to length, cut it to length, pre-pull my wire through it so I'm encountering less resistance. I've got a little bit more latitude to manipulate the wire. I'm going to manually pass the wire through this 90 degree fitting into the cabinet, which is that's pretty tight turn for wiring, and uh, get everything seated and then tighten up my fittings and finalize the installation. So different process than working with rigid conduit. Um, rigid conduit does have a maximum 360 degrees of bends between pull points, access points. So that would be 490s. Um, and in this case, uh, because of the, well, you can see it here. Look at that. <clears throat> Comes on rolls, right? <laughs> I've got more than 360 degrees of bends. I'm like at 850. So uh, it's just, there's just a lot of potential for resistance. You're going to have to work it through little by little. Um, pro tip, if you set this in the sun, and wiring too, if you set it in the sun, it'll all become more pliable and uh, you'll, you'll save time. All right, I've got just a little bit of extra in case that unit needs to move for servicing or what have you. Probably doesn't. I'm cutting it with a utility knife. You can see how lightweight that is. I'm gonna install my straight fitting and I'm probably gonna do it bottom left. Really no magic to this, but um, I just want it to come in with the space it needs, and I don't want the conductors to kind of break hard across that ground lug. Um, that could wear through over time. This installation will be vibrating because of the AC unit. <clears throat> I just don't want it to rub and wear. <clears throat> Some lock nuts can really be a beast. I just want you to be aware, if you're struggling with your lock nut, sometimes the manufacturers haven't really punched them out that far, and they can just be grueling. Occasionally, even, your, uh, your knockouts will have to be drilled out. And there are such a thing as drill outs that are not knockouts. Um, you do have to take a drill to them and to get through there. All right, look at this. This is how the fittings install. <clears throat> If you've got another opinion on any of this, please comment below. You guys are going to have tips and tricks that I've never considered before. Um, or maybe you'll correct a bad habit I've had for a long, long time. I'd welcome any of that. Um, this rubber gasket, in my opinion, installs on the outside of the cabinet. And anytime I've got a gasket, I always use it because I want to prevent wasps, ants. You'd be surprised how often outdoor electrical equipment particularly that's close to the ground, becomes occupied with um, unwanted, untenable residents. Uh, 
Again, tighten with tooling, get a good snug fit. I'm gonna use flathead and a pair of linemen. This, this is my favorite hammer. You're gonna hear me say that over and over again. I'm gonna snug it down. If you really go beating on that, you'll strip the threads. It's just plastic. All right, I've got a couple of short scrap lengths here. If I was pulling off rolls, I'd be using a wire caddy to manage, um, manage the conductors and keep them from twisting and tangling, but these are only 10 to 15 feet long as it is. I bent a shepherd's hook on the end of that. That's really gonna ease the passage of my wire through the conduit. I, I could bend it on one and tape them all together or just bend an individual and to avoid congestion, I'm, I'm intentionally gonna put them at different lengths. I'll even that up at the end. But again, there can be quite a bit of resistance, so I'm gonna straighten this out as much as possible. I'm gonna step on one end, hold it up, less bend, less resistance. There we are, that was easy. Um, this newer wire is called Simpull. Um, it's probably what you're buying off the shelf today. And it has, um, almost feels lubricated to the touch and makes a big difference uh, versus the older stuff. I've got plenty for termination on both ends. I'm gonna leave myself an intentional extra six inches or a foot and that's just so I can lay it in there, have some serviceability. Uh, I want a little extra. I'm gonna slip the collar over the wire, one at a time here. We get the top end in place first, so it's kind of holding itself up. I'm gonna give it a pre-twist to the left at this point, and. because I'm going to end up twisting to the right here. There we go. You can see up the fitting because of those slots and notches. And I want to get it up there and then a little bit more. It'll reach a firm shoulder. The end of my conduit didn't uh, enter real well because it was a little bit flattened and misshapen. But pretty self-explanatory. Righty tidy from this perspective looking straight onto the object. Again, tool tight. It's plastic, so take it easy. Man, one mark of a real professional, and actually sometimes I do scar the fittings, but a real professional sizes the tool correctly, snugs it up just right, and the fitting should not be scarred when you're done. Ground to ground connection. This time I'm gonna use, uh, for no, just demonstration purposes, a gray wire nut. This wire nut's also good for two stranded number 10s together. I'm gonna to give them a pre-twist to the right, make sure they're well seated. Wire nut on to the right. And anytime I'm outdoors and I can, I wanna put my wire nuts in that position because let's say somebody leaves this open, rain gets in, and my wire nut's oriented like this. Well, at that point, my electrical connect connections, they're pooling in the water, and um, they're just corroding, is all that's doing. It's not necessarily created a, an immediate hazard because the electrical connection, um, quite a bit of integrity there, but it's, it's long-term potentially, potentially gonna make a, a difference, and it's gonna get me in the good habit of putting all my wire nuts um, in the optimal orientation. Here we go, I'm gonna put a little service loop in there. Just for the sake of workmanship and color coding, I'm gonna match my red to the right side. Oops. Uh, like I did on the line side. Remember, line side, load side, alphabetical order. Uh, loosen my, a couple of my strands are not 
going in there smoothly and that's because I need to loosen my terminal screw. Uh, there it is. I'm gonna do the wiggle seat method on all of my stranded conductors. There are a couple of uh, possibilities here. One is, let's say you used half inch liquid tight and a three quarter inch knockout and uh, you're oversized. You accidentally knocked out or drilled a hole that's larger than what your liquid tight will accommodate. You can use a reducing washer or a set of two reducing washers that are available at any hardware store, one on the inside, one on the outside, that effectively reduces the diameter of the hole from one conduit size down to the next or two smaller or three smaller conduit sizes depending on the uh, fittings of choice. Okay, time to install the fuses. I've selected for a fuse disconnect again just by default there's no magic here. I'm gonna put my fuses and install 30 amp fuses that will equate or, or equal the uh, breaker rating inside. I could downsize my fuses or upsize my fuses as long as, and it would be inconsequential, as long as the wire and the equipment are all properly protected. So that could be accomplished at the breaker or it could be accomplished at the breaker and the fuse. It could be a combination of things, but um, in this case, it's all 10 gauge wire, 30 amp fuses. Fuses are in the vertical position. Don't know that it matters, but again, I've got the writing facing out. It's vertical, so you can see exactly what's taking place there. A little bit more serviceable, professional. I'm gonna go ahead and replace this mini. One, it's undersized. And two, uh, I want it all to, to look good and work good. That's That um, anchor is starting to come loose as well. I don't actually know if it's gonna grab because I think the anchor that drilled, or the bit that drilled that hole is probably a quarter inch. But uh, heck, experimental, let's try it. If this hole doesn't hold, and I'd like to use this hole, right? Just seal it back up. But if it doesn't hold, I'll drill the new one. Oh guys, that's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I'm gonna peel away my excess. No problem at all. But again, man, if that was caulk, I'd be a mess right now. I'd have it on my gloves, I'd have it on my tools, I'd have it on my next job. I love the duct seal. That's, uh, that's what we're going for. It's important to note that the, uh, the Mini is just supposed to be snug. It's not actually supposed to be closed. That's not the point of the Mini. So um, I'm gonna tool tight this just a little bit. There it is, it's all I need right there. Down to this end of the unit. <clears throat> I'm gonna feed the wire through, one at a time more or less to avoid congestion that the 90 degree elbow on that fitting can be pretty tight. Oh, rookie mistake. <clears throat> Collar. All right, use my channel locks to uh, form the conduit so it's seat better to the fitting. I kind of twist left and right, wrestle it up there. Sometimes it'll vary distinctly with these fittings, depending on the manufacturer, thread to the right, especially with metallic liquid tight, so be mindful of that. Back to tool tight here. 
righty tighty without scarring the fittings up. There it is. All right, let's terminate. I am gonna do a, a loop of wire. Might as well even just cut off that shepherd's hook. Keep most of what I have here because I am replacing the unit. I don't know how much will be required inside the new unit. I'm certain beyond the shadow of a doubt that I've got plenty here. Let's clean that up. I'm not going to torque down these uh, terminals. I'm just going to snug them down. I know they're temporary. We're past the air conditioning season, so they probably won't run at all. But I'm still going to hook it up. Last but not least, the ground. Some guys will really, really insist that you've got to make up your grounds and neutral connections first. Um, in some situations, I think that's a really great idea. I don't necessarily require that here. What I have done is I've got a stranded conductor that I'm gonna to terminate to a, uh, a pretty, pretty small ground terminal at the back. And I've left this little nub on the end to keep the stranded conductors contained. Um, that's really gonna help me out, keep them from just splaying out underneath the force of the screw. I could uh, use a stake on, and I might in the permanent installation, but I think that is gonna be uh, a unit that's 25, 30 years junior to this unit here, and it's probably gonna have a much better ground, ground terminal. Look at that, it's not even snugging up. If this was a permanent installation, I'd need to address that. But again, this, this thing's out of here in a week. Let's put the cover back on. So a couple things I wanna show you about the disconnect and torquing things down too is, when the disconnect is in non position, <clears throat> the cover is captive, you can't open it. So you gotta shut it off, depress the tab, and now you can get it to rest. This disconnect on the inside cover specifies 36 to 40 inch pounds of torque. Uh, so it's time to use our torque screwdriver. Set right there to 36, yeah, about 37 inch pounds. And that's gonna require quite a bit of force. There it is. As soon as you hear that first click, you're done. Uh, I got almost a whole turn out of that one. There it is. Uh, and we're gonna assume, man, you know what that can do, but we're gonna assume that this terminal is gonna be the same. There it is. Since it's equally sized, both wire, screw size, and it's in the same enclosure. A couple more things to summarize here. One, this disconnect would be required to be labeled for the equipment that it protects if it is not readily evident. In this case, it's readily evident. I've got a conduit leaves the disconnect, goes to the AC unit. It's a standard setup, labeling not required. Now what I am gonna do is I'm gonna go um, determine the breaker number in there. I'm gonna write it in Sharpie on the inside of this. I'm just gonna further uh, provide clarity to anybody working on this in the future. All right, breaker 1618. I'm going to, I've already turned on power. Now it's time to test. Make sure everything's squared away at the end here. And join us for the next video where we're not just replacing an air conditioner disconnect, but we are actually replacing 
a whole electrical panel.